Welcome to the Aquarius Solar Festival of the 2025 initiative. Today is the first day of approach to the hierarchy as we, as the sun and we together with it journey through the sign of Aquarius. And our guest today is uh, Judith Hedges from Hungary and uh, together we will reflect and meditate uh, on the principle of sharing. Hi Judith. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us today and leading us in this exploration and reflection and meditation at the end. So I will make you a presenter so you will be able to share your screen. Okay, yes, now we can see your screen. Thank you so much and a warm welcome to everyone uh, who is with us today. It's really, really nice to be with all of you and uh, reflect on, on sharing. Um, when Sasha asked me to talk about this topic, it seems so simple because it's just one word. But as I reflected a bit more deeply and spent a bit more time with this one word, sharing, it became obvious to me that it is actually very, very complex. So I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards and, and your thoughts and your reflections as well. Okay. I'm try okay. So, First, uh, if we could just start with a definition, and I also would like to give you a little bit of a, a structure for the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I would like to just define sharing uh, as much as possible. Um, where is its, pl its place in the current economic system? Uh, we will touch a little bit upon the idea of flow versus accumulation. What does it mean, spiritually speaking, and what does it mean on the practical level? Let's discuss the, the mutual use versus concept of ownership and the implications it has for sharing itself, and talk about the mental model and the physical implementation of sharing itself, the, the mental model that is required to actually physically implement sharing. And then we will conclude with a meditation after your questions. So what is sharing? Um, I have used the Alice Bailey writings uh, as a source and uh, a couple of other philosophers. Uh, I actually studied economics and I have originally a business background. So I, I looked a little bit at sharing as an economic uh, activity as well and just generally how we approach it um, in the business world today or in the economic systems that um, define our times currently. And I have a really nice definition right away from the Lucy's Trust uh, website. Sharing is in essence a manifestation of synthesis and the natural effect of justice in its clearest form. Sharing is also an active expression of the oneness of humanity. I read a little bit, uh, um, I reread uh, a little bit of Rudolf Steiner's writings on the topic. As you probably are aware, he has a concept called a threefold social order, where um, the order consists of three spheres of life, uh, economics, the law, and spiritual life. And he talks about the requirement of brotherhood in economic life the requirement of equality for all in front of the law, and the requirement of freedom for spiritual life, ideally, in his threefold social order. When I saw this right away, um, I started thinking about how do we do this today? And 
I think we get some of those things wrong. We just apply the wrong things to the wrong sphere. We don't have brotherhood in economic life. Brotherhood is essentially sharing. That's what he means. But we don't have that. Instead, we mistakenly believe we have freedom in economic life. But really, all we're saying is that we allow competition. That's really all we're saying. Um, there is another philosopher I read a little bit um, by on this topic, and I don't have him here, but Karl Marx talks about sharing, the sharing of economic resources. Yet, I think we can say that communist ideology itself um, implemented a forced kind of sharing, which did not have anything to do with the active expression of the oneness of humanity. So what are we sharing? What are those resources that we're talking about? They could be different kinds. Um, there is a special case. I mentioned money as crystallized energy, because we share that as well. We share physical resources like food, fuel, housing, uh, clean air, I think is a physical resource. But there are other things as well, education, healthcare, social services. These three, education, healthcare, and social services, are considered public goods by economists at the moment, meaning that everyone benefits from it, or everyone should ideally benefit from them. How does sharing fit into the current mainstream economic systems? The current focus of our economic system is actually on growth and only growth. But it doesn't make any sense because we live in a closed system. The Earth is a closed system. And it is impossible to grow forever in a closed system. But if you read any financial news, it's very clear the stock market only goes up. The share prices for companies only go up if the investors expect those companies to grow. The other complication is that resources often cross borders. The system we live in today does not take that into account at all. Clean air is a wonderful example here, because if you have polluting um, entities in one country, but there is another country next door that's really close, there is no clean air for anyone. There is a mental requirement for sharing, and that is to understand the concept of circulation or flow versus accumulation. The latter is actually a dead end street, as we will see, I think. How about the concept of guardianship versus ownership? When we talk about sharing, we also have to mention that the right maintenance, the right management, and development of resources, these are also part of sharing. This is where skills in action are required. You have to be the right kind of person with the right knowledge and the right skills to be able to maintain and manage resources right. The question for all of us then becomes, how do I as an individual keep the flow going? We do that by finding the best uses for the resources to make us all whole. We can keep physical possession while giving back to the flow mentally. I think this is very, very important because it doesn't mean that no one can own anything. It just means that mentally you give whatever you own to the flow by finding the right kind of use for your resources. How do we find the right kind of use for our resources? We use the intuition to find that. We have to constantly look for the right service opportunities for these resources that we have access to. Ultimately, what we need to do is to keep the divine circulatory flow going, and this will reproduce resources as well. So this last point then ties with the very first one, where I talked about the right maintenance and the right management of resources that we can share. What are the challenges or some challenges to implementing sharing? The first one I would say is face the shadow. Fear and greed are the two emotions that play a very, very important role in creating obstacles to the divine flow. There is a perception of scarcity of resources. And I actually remember this from Economics 101 when I took this course in college. This is the first thing they teach you. 
the assumption is that there is a fixed amount of resources and we have to compete for that. But what is it really? It's a denial of the divine flow and denying the fact that we are creative participants in our own lives. Currently, there is a challenge with fear wanting to hoard, stifling the flow, and I think all financial crises from at least the 20th century, but the latest one also is a good example from 2008. What happens if, if you look at um, the cycle of creating a, a crisis? Is it starts with greed, and then fear takes over. So then the resources just don't move. They don't go to their right places. The flow is um, choked in a way. Another example today, those of you who read the news, very often uh, countries talk about corporate taxation and how multinationals actually don't pay a lot of taxes. As a matter of fact, they do everything in order not to pay any taxes anywhere. But what is happening is that they're sitting um, on huge piles of cash that they could be putting to productive use elsewhere. How do we implement sharing? Briefly, again, the first point, cultivate the appropriate mental attitude of oneness. This is unavoidable and we have to do this constantly. Enable the soul impressions to reach us and show where we can find the best use for the resources we have access to. Another point um, to start is the idea of simplicity on the physical plane. Some of you may be familiar with um, Marie Kondo, who is a Japanese, uh, what should I call her? She's really an artist, I would say, uh, but essentially she established a school of thought which holds that um, tidying up is a very important activity and you have to declutter to allow the divine flow in your life. So I think she has the spiritual foundation completely right for this. She was discovered about three or four years ago. She has written a number of books. They, most of them were translated into English and they are very, very popular in Europe as well as the United States. She wages, the way she puts it, she wages the ruthless war on stuff. So the idea is to declutter and she tells you what questions to ask when you're trying to get rid of stuff you don't need anymore. She says, think consciously about what you need. Ask yourself the question, is there a connection between your need and the object? And then the next question should be, could it provide more joy for someone else? She wrote a book called Spark Joy, and I especially like the fact that she's using joy and not happiness. Joy is a soul quality, so it goes way beyond happiness and, and the deep connection that we have, but also not just with each other, but with our objects. But she talks about how it has to be the right kind of connection. When you no longer have a connection, give that object back to the divine flow. There are some other encouraging examples in the world for sharing, and um, I would like to talk first about the growth in the nonprofit sector worldwide. And I have seen that on all continents. I worked in the nonprofit sector myself. This is really the past 10 or 15 years. The nonprofit sector attracts skilled managers nowadays who essentially want to share their skills and their energy, but also there's a lot of money involved because these organizations are able to fundraise now a lot more seriously, and there's a lot more money going to um, um, productive uses through them. Some new services you have heard about, it's an entirely new business model based on sharing, ride-sharing, housing. Uh, for ride-sharing, Uber, Get, Lyft, um, they're all well-known companies, I think, worldwide, uh, especially in the United States, but also in Europe and some other places as well. Uh, I think everyone has heard of Airbnb. It's the right idea because what they're really doing is they're providing a better distribution for resources. So another form of sharing, get a better um, distribution. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, I put them here because they were the very first one of this kind. 
There were many other that came after them, but Bill Gates was really the first person who said, I've earned a lot of money and I want to share it with others. And they have done a wonderful job um, over the past uh, 15 years or so, almost 15 years. There are also other billionaires who want to share their um, financial resources through this kind of work. And um, somebody mentioned the other day that a shockingly low number of billionaires, I think less than 80, own more than half of the world's wealth or something like that. But if only one or two have this idea, yeah, this means a lot of resources that are put into circulation with the chance to find the right use to make us all whole, the entire world. Another welcome development over the years has been the growth in volunteerism. And I especially saw that in schools, primary schools and secondary schools, um, as well as later uh, in life. People volunteer their time and often their skills. So this is another form of sharing. And finally, because I worked quite a lot in education, I was very happy to see the, the growth in service learning in education. This is primary and secondary education, but you can really start this earlier. Schools very often um, organize service trips. Um, they also create a module. Um, the IB, the International Baccalaureate, has a service learning module included in the last two years of the program. This is a wonderful way of learning sharing early on in life. So I think I'm not out of time. Uh, I think, yeah, I'm pretty much on time. But this, this was it for me, uh, from me. And I'm looking forward very much to your questions. Mm, we open the floor for sharing and discussion. We chose originally the topic of sharing for the Aquarius full moon exactly for the reason that Judith outlined that it's the flow of the divine energy. And we know that Aquarius is the water of life that pour into down to the thirsty man. So I invite you to share your thoughts on how the principle of sharing could be implemented. And if you have any questions, please share them with the group and uh, Judith or anyone else in the audience who would like to contribute to answer that, uh, to share on that uh, question, please do. And um, by default, everyone is muted on the webinar to avoid sound reverberations. But if you would like to speak, please use the function raise your hand. and. Uh, we will unmute you. Also, you can use the questions section of, uh, on your control panel to share your thoughts. But of course, it's always better uh, to hear someone's voice uh, and hear your note. And there is first question coming from Michael. He asks, can you please give an example of the mental sharing of resources you mentioned earlier? Thank you. I think you ref uh, uh, were talking about the right mental attitudes in terms of sharing. Yes, that's that. Um, what I was talking about um, is that you have to keep the mental attitude of divinity and oneness. You can take physical possession of something, but have the mental approach, the mental attitude that allows sharing for that resource. So one example, I'll give you a very, very simple example just to illustrate the, the direction of energy in this case. So for example, I have a book. I bought that book and I have read that book. But the book is still on my bookshelf. I hear uh, when I talk to friends uh, one day that one of them could be interested in that book. So I give that person that book. And then I try to find another person and another person so more people can actually share what's in the book and benefit from it. 
I know this is a very, very simple example, but it shows you that the book remains in my possession all this time. It is still my book. But it's not just sitting on my bookshelf the entire time. I'm actually giving it to people to read it. Does that answer your question? If there are any follow-up questions, please, Michael, uh, you might raise your hand and we will unmute you or you can write your further comments. Uh, there is another a comment coming from uh, uh, Melia. Uh, and meanwhile, Michael just wrote, yes, thank you. And so Melia says, the book Blessed Unrest describes the great rise of sharing through the non-profit sector. There was a YouTube coverage of the author's presentation on the subject at a Bioneers conference, which is very powerful. I, I really you. like that, and I, I'm actually writing this down as, as you were speaking, Sasha, because the nonprofit sector, in a way, so in my ideal world, um, the nonprofit sector doesn't differ from the for profit sector, they kind of blend into one. Because essentially, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to create value for other people. The only question is, what do we do with any money that's left over? So I am hoping that the world is going in a direction where the for-profit and not-for-profit distinctions will actually disappear over time. Because essentially, what happens is, uh, and I have seen this in education. I have worked with schools that were not for profit and I have worked with schools that were for profit and there wasn't actually much of a difference in the daily life of the students. The only difference was, uh, you know, at the end of the accounting year they looked at um, their financial results and then, you know, in some cases the owner who had a lot of goodwill simply said, okay, we made a loss we're supposed to be for profit, it doesn't really matter because I will support this um, enterprise. And some of the for profit schools, I have seen much worse behavior because the boards simply said, well, we need to really invest the money in better buildings or you know, some other non productive uses. So it didn't necessarily mean that just because something is not for profit, it's going to be better. I think Again, and this is my dream, that in a couple of decades we'll be in a situation where every enterprise is going to focus on creating value efficiently for others. And what the accounting definition will be, uh, whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit, it doesn't matter. Where I think the not-for-profit um, sector growth really matters is that it allows people of goodwill to really focus on specific goals for others. This is where I think it's significant. And, you know, when I graduated from business school uh, in New York 12 years ago, we had only 35 people show up for the first um, meeting of the Social Enterprise Club, and now there are hundreds of people. So, so I've seen the difference it made over time and just how big this growth was. And I do think it's wonderful, and I'm hoping to see some sort of a response from the for-profit sector soon. Sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it, it kind of, you know, it, um, it, it puts sharing in a different light. Thank you, Judith. Uh, there is a question from Daniela. Um, Daniela, please unmute yourself. Thank you. I just wanted to share <clears throat> about um, a project that we have here amongst, it, it's about women for the time being, it's, we are around 8 to 10 and um, we meet regularly every month or so. Each of us has a project and each month we share ideas on to, as to how to realize that project and we share our resources, our time together and support each other in, you know, realizations. So that's, I would say, one example of sharing that could be implemented rather easily in, in our micro cosmoses. <laughs> A 
that's such a great example. Thank you. I think it's very interesting uh, way looking at the topic that's um, sharing. It's not necessarily something narrow material uh, as traditionally it's viewed. Uh, sharing can have many different forms as long as we keep that attitude of the flow and connect it with this circulatory flow of divine energy then the forms that the sharing can get exactly as in the your example Daniela it can be just a cooperative of uh, people who think uh, along the same line uh, and share the same values and they can support each other with ideas and uh, whenever it's possible with resources and time yeah yeah exactly and skills and skills exactly and skills indeed okay, okay there is a number of people who have their hands raised so um I didn't really follow who was the first and second to raise the hand but I will start with uh Robin so I will mute Robin Yes, thank you, Judith, for um, your preparing your thoughts and sharing them with us. Um, the concept of circulation, circulating, flowing as um, an element of sharing or is sharing, uh, I have so many thoughts. Uh, I'll try to narrow them down here. But this really, as I heard you talk, may, reminded me of... of um, the thoughts that I've had about sharing. I'm um, like you, I'm a, a business person, but I'm like you, I'm 61 years old. So in a different phase of my life. And I'm being at the very tail end of the baby boomer generation here in the States, I see so many people who um, are no longer in the profit or not for profit part of the economy, um, and therefore they just kind of drop out of the circulating flow of sharing. And I see so many people looking for how do I stay in circulation uh, in a meaningful way, in a way that allows me to use my skills and resources I have available to me. Um, and I would love to hear any thoughts that people have um, about how potentially to do that in some new in ways, um, because there are many different... Well, I'll just be quiet there, and, and if anyone has any thoughts, Thank you, Robin. <laughs> um, I will unmute Celeste now. Oh, Celeste, please unmute yourself on your end. Yes, uh, Celeste. Um, you are unmuted, but for some reason we can't hear you, so maybe um, there's some technical problems that you will be able to figure out, so I will unmute now Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I really appreciate this uh, call, and... But there's a little feedback for here it's for me, so it's it's a little difficult to um, hear. But anyway, looking at corporate structures, I put a lot of thought into that. The difference between the profit and the nonprofit world, at least 
the way it's organized here in the States, um, that there's a triangle there with government, corporations, nonprofit world that is troubling to me uh, because for-profits are the only ones who can lobby the government for change. Uh, nonprofit 501c3s cannot. Um, and I think that puts a glitch in the divine circulatory flow because nonprofits tend to be the ones who have the more inclusive, forward looking vision um, as opposed to the for profits with investors who want an eternal return on investment. So I'm looking at this new, newer structure, maybe you know more about it, the L3C, that's kind of, you were talking about maybe in 20 years the lines between profit and nonprofit would blur and we would have more circulation. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on that. Are you there? I, yeah, I'm wondering actually if um, uh, it is possible for a certain number not to lobby. Uh, but you're right, it's much more difficult because not-for-profits tend to be way smaller and they also tend to be very often local. So it's difficult for them to come together and be as effective with lobbying the government as, as corporations are. I mean, corporations have very long traditions and lots of resources devoted to lobbying um, the government. I absolutely agree with you that there is a glitch in the, the circulatory flow right there because you're right. The nonprofits tend to have a much more inclusive um, kind of view. And um, it, you know, they don't just focus on the material aspects of things. But at the same time, I think that corporations will be forced, I am hoping at least, they'll be forced to think about how to satisfy all of their stakeholders in the future. In other words, I think, because some corporations, I mean, they, they, they have a lot more resources at their disposal than some smaller governments in the world. And um, that's a very tough situation. I also think that there will be a common sense element, possibly, for investors when they realize that their long-term strategy and their long-term need is really for all groups of stakeholders involved with the corporation um, to be satisfied. W what I mean by that, and this is my hope, is that, um, for example, a corporation will think about the town it's in as a group of stakeholders. In other words, the people that live in the town where the corporation is located they become a group of stakeholders for the corporation. Also, uh, something like suppliers, because there will be, if you're a large corporation, there are constantly hundreds of suppliers dependent on your business and dependent on the income from your business. So treat them as another um, stakeholder group. The people who work for you, your, your employees, they're also a stakeholder group. Now, what keeps this from happening? I think there is one thing right now that keeps it from happening, and that is the accounting focus on profit itself. As long as our accounting system focuses on, you know, re um, income minus um, cost expenses and, and how much money you have at the end of the year to return to your stakeholders, then unfortunately, as long as that's the case, that will be the incentive for the corporation to behave that frames their, their model. As, as soon as we change that, as soon as we change the accounting focus on profit, then there will be an incentive for corporations as well to change. Uh, what do I mean by that? And I, I think there is already several schools of thought that work in this direction, but 
you know, something like non-renewable resources. If you use them, it should show up as a negative, as an expense on your accounting statement. Something like that. If you um, do something sustainable in the town for the town's residents, it could show up as a positive thing um, in your accounting statement. I mean, you could create, you could devise an accounting system that could reward and provide an incentive for providing these things for stakeholder groups. I think that will be the way. I think that I think the moment corporations realize that there is no growth in a closed system. There is no growth. I mean, what we're living right now is, is an unreal uh, reality, economically speaking. We reward growth when we know perfectly well that we live in a closed system and that cannot go on forever. So the moment someone wakes up, and I think it will be soon, hopefully, uh, we could start adjusting the accounting systems so you reward those kinds of things that would make corporations behave differently. I, I do realize this is not going to be immediate and it could possibly be decades, but I already see some, um, uh, you know, some, a lot of people actually working in, in this direction, and there are some economists as well who are thinking about this very seriously. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. Can I also address the previous question about how people could stay in circulation? Yes, please, of course. Because I had a thought about that as, as I was hearing the question, and um, I, I think the difficult thing here is that very often you have to create your own opportunities for service because they're just not there depending on where people live. There, there, maybe there just aren't any groups that um, collect people who have time to help others. Or, um, But if you look around, I do think that we're confronted with so many situations daily, it is entirely possible for people to create their own service opportunities. And I think that maybe this is how we have to think um, as we have more time on our hands. There was a follow-up uh, question uh, coming from Deborah. Uh, Deborah, I had to mute you because there was echo coming from you, but um, now you unmute it again if you want to ask your follow-up question. Yes, um, I, re I really like the idea of changing the accounting logic uh, for current corporations, but I think that's a legal issue as well because once they go on the stock market, they are legally required to maximize investment, return on investment for their investors. So how do we change that? So you're right about that. And of course, you would have to change the rules of the stock market at the same time. That, that goes without saying, because you're right, right now, uh, corporations and the leadership of corporations, they have um, a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder revenue and everything is written up that way. But for me, it, when I meant accounting change, I meant a system change as well. Because the moment we realize that growth for profits is not possible in a closed system forever, we have to also change everything, including the way the stock market operates. I'm actually not quite sure if there will be a stock market in 100 years, but you know, until we get there, um, I think we will go through some sweeping changes. Thank you. Interesting if you think on this question of uh, corporations who are able to uh, lobby uh, the government. Uh, another example came to me where actually nonprofit have consultative access to power, so to speak, is the, at the United Nations, where uh, the NGOs can be uh, can be can have consultative status there, and by large, probably it's this this system doesn't work well uh, with this, but as an uh, as an ideal uh, that could be sometimes in the future sp spread 
and uh, that non-governmental sector, non-for-profit non sector could have their say as well with uh, governments. That's something for us to keep in, in light of the intention of our meditation. I will unmute now Sharon. Yeah, hey, uh, Sasha, thank you. And uh, part of my comment was already addressed um, with the um, idea that corporations, when they go into the stock market, they're legally bound to make a profit. Um, but the other part of my uh, question or comment had to do with the fact that we um, each individually have a way of sharing the resources uh, that we have currently. And, you know, when we talk about corporations, profit, nonprofit, there's this sense of perhaps otherness, you know, but we're a part of the profit and the nonprofit organizations and we support them and we share with them as we direct our money, our dollars. And so, um, and, and that's coming to light, I think, in a very Aquarian way when we're looking at uh, some of these banks that are funding uh, DAPL, you know, or the pipelines and the people are saying we don't want the pipelines but the money that we have is going in to support the banks that support the pipelines. <laughs> and so we're getting an idea of as we individually have the determination and the conviction to share in a way that actually withdraws us from the matrix of all of this, um, that in a way it's, it's a way of sharing, uh, that we ourselves, each one of us, is a little profit, nonprofit center. And whatever we can do to direct the money and the resources that we have uh, toward the light, you know, we each become uh, an attractive and magnetic unit in the master's plan. So, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Celeste, uh, let's try one more time if uh, see if we could hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh boy. <laughs> oh good. Thank you, <laughs> Sasha. Thank you, Judith. And everybody for your patience. Um, my question now has gone around through a few people's answers. So uh, one is Robin's asking about how the uh, people who are not apparently participating can be included in the flow. Also, all of the uh, the connections to education that come up, and now Sharon's offering of how we are each empowered uh, as a contributor or, or a participator as we see ourselves with our own dollar and our own actions in everyday life. Um, all that coming together to to join where I find the platforms um, that I've been participating in concerning the the ancient wisdom and the groups that are all connected and sharing so much um, based on the Alice Bailey material and um, there's an incredible sharing going on. And I'm wondering, are there uh, avenues into the educational system? Are we sharing this um, not just with adults who can access this of their own volition, but are there any secondary or elementary school avenues where people can receive this? Does anyone know about that?
I can share something um, which gave me a lot of joy, actually, because um, I think um, it, it, I'm, I live in Hungary right now, and they're talking about um, mindfulness a lot in the school system. So there's some talk about uh, making meditation part of um, actually the primary school curriculum. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you meant exactly, but I think this is a good start. Right. Um, because we're talking about a national system, so with any national school system, it's, it's difficult to make a change. But I think mm -hmm. mindfulness is now um, very commonly talked about. So um, that is, if, if it becomes a part of the system here, that's great. And I think because service learning is now part of the secondary school curriculum, that is also another great thing. That you actually take you know, some time every week and you go out and you help other people or you have a project together where you really think about the needs of others. You might argue it's too late in secondary school. It would be much better to start in primary school, but you, know, you have to start somewhere. Yes, no, I think secondary is a great place to start for, for that kind of outward action. Yeah. I'm thinking more of the foundation of the divine flow, the concept that all of these people who may or may not be participating in a more outward action, that we are all capable of participating daily uh, on an inward action like the new group of world servers, that everybody could be, especially the disenfranchised of the world who feel that they're not participating or that there's no place for them, they could be doing lots of contribution in the light service. If anyone has uh, any comments or uh, other examples of that, please share with the group. Back a few months ago, we had a very interesting webinar on the Virgo uh, Solo Festival with Gloria Krug, and she uh, shared um, the work that uh, she and her colleagues been doing for many decades uh, in Texas. And uh, one of the um, examples that she shared was the uh, United Nations model for uh, schools uh, curriculum uh, that they organize uh, their, their group. And, um, you can go back in their uh, archive recordings of that webinar and listen it again. Uh, it was a very wonderful example, I think, Thank of something you. that Celeste is asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There were some comments coming, meanwhile, uh, in the um, question section, so I will uh, share some of them. So, um, I Sorry, I just lost the comment that I was about to read. I, I guess I posted it in the wrong window. So, uh, Joe, there was your comment. If you could please repost it again and I will read it. Sorry, it's it disappeared from my screen. I don't see it anymore. But meanwhile, I will uh, share another comment uh, coming from... Um, uh, Simon, so it's a quote from uh, Agni Yoga. Uh, I will read it and you can read it follow. It's in the chat section of your control panel. Of course, imperil is the main destroyer of psychic energy. But one should not forget three other violators. 
fear, doubt, and self-pity. When it becomes possible to physically measure psychic energy, it will be instructive to see how this darkness work to disrupt the flow of energy. But the flow of energy can be supported by countering efforts based upon self-sacrifice and achievement. These seemingly abstract concepts affirm the reality of the life principle, whose energy is cognizable and measurable. And Simon says thank you to Judith. I don't think that is the part of the quote from Agni Yoga. Thank you, Simon. If Judith, if you have any thoughts on this quote or anything else, please you can step in a moment. I, I really liked fear, doubt, self-pity. Very correct. Very correct, indeed. Um, I mean, I talked about fear uh, a little bit, but I think doubt could make us less effective. Self-pity could take the right direction away. And I think it's always very good to think about these three things, to what extent they're um, present in our lives and to what extent they're essentially obstacles of oneness. And it is very interesting because in Hungarian, um, the, the word for, for fear is half-ness, and the word for doubt is two-ness. <laughs> in other words, everything is described as in relation to oneness. Fear and doubt are in opposition of oneness. Fear causes us to be half, and doubt causes us to be um, essentially um, two-sided when we, we really should just be one. So I find this, um, I guess none of you really speak Hungarian, but, I, but when I realize what these words actually mean, I mean, there is some divine wisdom right in the words. And ever since I realized this, we, we know these words since uh, we're toddlers, but we somehow don't always know the meaning until later. And uh, uh, now when I think about these words, it becomes clear to me how they block oneness, just the words themselves. So really the, the opposite side would be think about um, being one with our soul all the time, as much as we can. It's a very deep thought. Can you just repeat one more time this, the, these two words, uh, how they translated from Hungarian? Fear and doubt. So, so fear um, is, uh, uh, I'm just thinking how to, so, so there's oneness, right? And fear is halfness. So when you fear something, what you say in Hungarian is, um, I am half of myself, only half, not my entire self. Because if I were my true entire self, my one true self, I would not have any fear. Doubt means um, two-sidedness, meaning that you cannot decide whether you should uh, go with your, probably what they mean is whether you should go with your soul or with your personality because the two pull you in different directions. So this is doubt. You're not sure because you don't recognize the soul vis-a-vis -vis the personality. So with doubt you become two-sided because these two things pull you in two different directions and with fear, because you lose your true self, you become half. But again, in between half and two, two, you have one, oneness. Thank you. It's interesting seat for meditation.
I will read another comment uh, from um, Michael. I would like to make this comment in astrology terms. If we picture the fixed well and we think of the corporation as an Aquarian entity which is opposite the sign of Leo, the source of all energy. If we were to stand on the sign of Aquarius to our left is Scorpio, the sign of deep meaningful change and to our right is Taurus, the sign of self-value projected out into the world. If we imagine the two other air signs, Gemini and Libra, I think the source of justice Libra is the gradual diminishment of the glamour of apparent duality present in Gemini. Thank you. And you can see this comment in the chat section of your control panel. And there is one more comment from uh, Amelia. I believe that our our daily choices about where we spend our currency makes a real difference. As long as we buy from the larger corporations, we support their actions. If we can be mindful and spend our currency in small local businesses, the business models will change. Thank you, Miriam. I so agree with that. And I, I think very often we underestimate ourselves. But I think everyone matters in this. Every single individual. And if we re uh, reflect again on the question that um, Michael posed at the beginning uh, in terms of the example of the importance of the mental attitudes in terms of sharing. I think the, the meditative work that we all do is another example of that mental attitude that works. That we put our energy of our intention behind the certain thought forms and that's how it contributes to the overall um, collective mindset and those ideas start to precipitate in uh, people's minds and hearts and bring in the gradual change. And so that's what I suggest we now turn into now service for humanity through meditative work. So, Judith, please lead us in meditation. So we start with the group fusion. And we affirm the fact of group fusion and integration within the heart center of the new group of world servers, mediating between hierarchy and humanity. I am one with my group brothers, and all that I have is theirs. May the love which is in my soul pour forth to them. May the strength which is in me lift and aid them. May the thoughts which my soul creates reach and encourage them. Alignment. We project a line of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, the planetary heart, the great ashram of Sanat Kumara, and towards the Christ at the heart of the hierarchy. Extend the line of light towards Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known.
higher interlude. Hold the contemplative mind open to the extra planetary energies streaming into Shambhala and radiated through hierarchy. Using the creative imagination, endeavor to see the three planetary centers, Shambhala, hierarchy, and humanity, gradually coming into alignment and interplay. Meditation. Reflect on the seed thought. Water of life am I. Pour forth for thirsty men.
precipitation. Using the creative imagination, visualize the energies of light, love, and the will to good pouring throughout the planet and becoming anchored on Earth in prepared physical plane centers through which the plan can manifest. Use the sixfold progression of divine love as the sequence of energy precipitation, Shambhala, hierarchy, the Christ, the new group of world servers, men and women of goodwill everywhere in the world, physical centers of distribution. lower interlude. Refocus the consciousness as a group within the periphery of the great ashram. Together sound the affirmation. In the center of all love I stand. From that center I, the soul, will outward move. From that center I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the Divine Self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world. Visualize the downpouring spiritual inflow released from Shambhala through the hierarchy and streaming into humanity through the prepared channel. Consider how these impouring energies are establishing the pathway of light for the coming world teacher, the Christ.
distribution. As the great invocation is sounded, visualize the outpouring of light and love and power from the spiritual hierarchy through the five planetary inlets, London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva, Tokyo, irradiating the consciousness of the whole human race. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Um. Um. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judith. It was a really great presentation. Thank you for focusing our meditation today. Thank you. I invite everyone to join our coming webinars. Our next webinar will be during the Pisces New Moon period and we will continue the cyclic meditation project focusing our collective intention on strengthening the thought forms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and during the Pisces New Moon we will bring our focus to uh, SDG 14, Life Below Water. So please join us on February 28th. 
and our next full moon webinar, last webinar in this year cycle of this astrological year ending in Pisces will be a webinar when we will reflect together on the state of the world affairs today and uh, Mins van der Velde from Switzerland, the director of the Lucis Trust office in Geneva, will share his thoughts on this topic and will lead us in meditation. So please join us on March 12th for the Pisces Solar Festival webinar. And let's finish our work today sounding together the Gayatri. O thou who gives the sustenance to the universe, from whom all things proceed, to whom all things return, unveil to us the face of the true spiritual sun hidden by the disk of golden light that we may know the truth and do our whole duty as we journey to thy sacred feet. Thank you.